Four o'clock in the morning in a small town, two young men approach their target. They're part of our team of investigators. They're going to enter a building without leaving a trace. Welcome to Open TX. The break-in begins from above. The person controlling the drone could be as far away as China or Russia. The drone is searching for unprotected networks and reporting them back to the hackers. The drone has reached the network and you can see the first packages come in. I see the first devices showing up, the first communication. We can read it. It's as easy as it sounds. As the attackers, we then just pick the easiest target. Digitization has now reached many areas of life in Germany, giving criminals new opportunities. We hear about hacking attacks almost every day, not least on our industrial infrastructure. Sometimes the victim is telecom, sometimes it's an industrial giant such as ThyssenKrupp. In one country, cyber criminals even achieved a blackout. What if something like that happens here? The scenario has already been played out in theory. How much danger is Germany in? We asked several hackers to find out for us. To highlight the dangers that come with increasing digitization, we start our research in the everyday digital world, where we're promised security and convenience. The digital home, controlling entire buildings with mobile devices, is becoming increasingly popular, like here in Austria, for example. This charming little hotel is such a building, and we're going to take a closer look at it. The owner has agreed. He doesn't know when the attack will occur. Owner Kurt Silner has embraced new technologies. There were regular problems in his stressful everyday life, such as with the cold store. On one occasion, the door wasn't closed properly. Another time, there was a power cut. That's particularly bad when the hotel is closed. The goods spoil quickly, and the financial damage to the family is significant. We always had the problem that on public holidays we weren't able to monitor our cold store. We thought about what to do about it. We bought a sensor for the cold store that sends temperature data straight to our mobiles. We get an email and can react to it immediately. The temperature app was just the beginning. You've added other smart functions. Can you tell us about those? There's an alarm located by the front door of the hotel. We're in the process of investing much more in this direction so we can be even safer. Be it an alarm or a temperature sensor, Kurt Zillner controls all of the functions via his phone. The app send the data via the internet. He was advised by his son, and he'll play an important role later on in this film. But first, the father will show us his digital world. In his home, for example, he has a lock with an access code that he can also control via his phone. This Internet of Things promises to be intelligent, convenient and secure. A smart home bundles a number of functions so that they can be centrally controlled. The intelligent control for this house takes care of the lighting. It opens and closes windows and it monitors doors in connection with an alarm system. It controls the solar panels on the roof and is supposed to help with managing energy consumption. Apps from the Internet of Things can also be centrally controlled. 
Items include household devices such as washing machines and surveillance cameras. Even light bulbs can be connected to the internet now. All these items can be controlled remotely over the internet with a smartphone. But how easy is it for hackers to access this data and thereby learn, for example, that the home of the hotel guest is currently unoccupied? Sebastian Strobel is an expert. He's looking for security loopholes to warn users not to harm them. He'll hack the hotel for us. Tobias Tilner, the son of the owner, will help him. He advised his father, but he's learned a few more things since then. The two hackers have developed programs that can manipulate smart home controls from the outside. These smart homes promise security. These components, such as the burglar alarms, are sold on the basis of delivering security. In most cases, technically knowledgeable attackers will be able to access these systems or influence various functions in these smart homes. Hotelier Kurt Silner bought into these promises for a long time too. He was excited about intelligent light bulbs that he could control from his smartphone as a protection against burglars, for example. But what he didn't see coming is that he brought about exactly the opposite. For us as attackers, the light bulbs aren't interesting. We want to open doors without being verified. Since both are online and both are using the same encryption material, it's easier to attack the light bulbs rather than the lock, which is better protected. It's Friday, 18 minutes to 8, the peak period. We're starting our attack unnoticed. Equipped with a transmitter and an internet connection, the drone penetrates the hotel network. Then it sends the data to the two hackers. We're in. The alarm system is deactivated, the doors open, we can get in. The hotelier feels safe because the app tells him everything's fine. The two hackers aren't damaging the door. They're using the key, but even a crowbar would have gone undetected because they deactivated the burglar alarm first. Their entry remains unnoticed by the app too. The surveillance cameras were manipulated from the outside. For the past 30 minutes, they've been showing a photo that was taken before, not the two intruders. They've even remotely cracked the combination lock for the private area. Kurt Silner still doesn't know that we've already completed our trial burglary. His security app didn't raise the alarm. The door's open. We can go in. Your son just broke into your hotel. What do you say to that? I'll be honest, I'm very surprised that it was that easy. I always thought we had a safe house, but that it's this easy in this day and age, via certain smartphone apps, still really surprises me. We too are amazed at how effortlessly the hackers succeeded in their attack. Unfortunately, from professional experience, it's no surprise. But as a private individual, you should be angry. Your promised features and security and end users innocently buy these products but are completely left in the dark about their own security. The security is fake. 
Hotelier Kurt Zilner has asked his son to take the insecure devices offline. Experts have a theory that Ukraine is a kind of test lab for hackers trying out the latest cyber weapons. In November 2015, this malware called Black Energy triggered a widespread power outage in Ukraine. A year later, there were more severe cyber attacks on the country. Even though the people of Kiev don't see much of the civil war, attacks on the electricity grid quickly became a matter of life and death in this struggling country. The Ministry for State Security has invited the international press to report on the latest cyber attacks in the country. They targeted the financial system, the metro, and once again the country's power supply. The old malware Black Energy is still fresh in people's minds, but it already has a successor. Oleg Zaychenko witnessed the attack on the electricity grid. He takes us to the scene of the crime about an hour's drive from Kiev. Well secured from the outside, the electrical substation outside the city. Because of the war with Russia, the country's energy supply is in a desperate state. The electricity demand can barely be met. Then the engineer shows me the room where he was forced to look on helplessly as the instruments developed a life of their own and couldn't be controlled from within anymore. I had the night shift on a completely normal day at the substation. Everything was fine. And then towards midnight, the switches started changing color. When I looked at the voltage divider transformers, I understood that the substation 110 to 330 kilovolts didn't have any voltage anymore. We were all shocked. Nobody could believe it. The cyber attack caused a red alert in the biggest control center in Europe, which monitors electricity lines from Russia to the EU. Zevolod Kovalchuk, the director of the state energy supplier, sees political motives behind the attacks. And these attacks could have disastrous consequences for the whole of Europe in the future. The European countries that have modern administration systems with highly connected, centrally controlled IT systems are even more vulnerable than Ukraine's isolated IT systems. That's why I believe that the things happening here will have consequences for developed countries like Germany and Austria too. I think because we're not so linked up, the consequences for the Ukrainian electricity grid were less than what could have happened in those other countries I mentioned. Ukraine got off lightly, but such an attack could have more serious consequences in Germany. How safe is our energy supply, given the increasingly connected nature of our systems? The Federal Office for Information Security refers us to existing laws governing the protection of our critical infrastructure. The IT security law came into force in Germany in summer 2015. There are minimum standards, requirements for operators of critical energy plants to report attacks. That has given us a different level of protection. Therefore, I think an attack like the one on Ukraine isn't likely in Germany. Really? We want to know more. We're visiting an expert who's interested in exactly this topic. Could hackers use loopholes to trigger a Europe-wide power outage? This is Matthias Dahlheimer. He wants to know how high the risk of a blackout is. We've already had a taster caused by a cruise liner from the Maya shipyard. That was the 4th of November, 2006. When a luxury liner was delivered on the Ems, a power cut with far-reaching consequences occurred. A single high-voltage power line was switched off. 
there were communication problems between the grid operators. This resulted in a Europe-wide chain reaction. The people didn't know what was going on. They couldn't reach the electricity supplier EDF. So they called us, but we didn't know what was going on either, or when power would be restored. The power cut lasted two hours. Why is the world's biggest electricity grid so vulnerable? Because it vibrates, as the experts put it. This is the European electricity grid. It reaches from Turkey to Portugal and Denmark to Italy. It's not a national grid, it's a big European wide grid. What's the frequency at which it vibrates? In Europe it's 50 hertz, plus, minus, smallish deviations, but generally speaking it's 50 hertz. The frequency reacts very sensitively to outages. Imagine it like a pair of old scales. There's the demand for electricity, meaning the sum of all electrical consumers, and then there's the supply. Normally this system's in balance. If a power station fails, one side becomes lighter, while the other becomes heavier. My frequency drops. The other power stations notice that and say, OK, let's power up a bit to restore the balance, and then I get my grid frequency of 50 Hz back. To cause a blackout, hackers would have to find a way to switch off as many consumers or producers simultaneously with one click. What do I need in order to bring about a blackout? I have a lot of wind energy and solar energy in the grid that has to be transported. I have a situation where a lot of electricity has to be moved to another country, such as England. These are all factors that already ramp it up a bit for the grid, but they're not normal issues. But if I can provoke another big jump in performance at exactly that time, the chances of triggering a blackout are high. A blackout in Europe lasting several days, potentially, would bring everything to a standstill. Concern about the vulnerability of critical infrastructure brings hackers, scientists and operators together. We're meeting an old acquaintance who has already had experience with hackers as the manager of a municipal power plant. Eberhard Oehle is the manager of the municipal works in Ettlingen. He's also responsible for power supply. The subject of decentralization is highly topical in energy supply circles. 20 years ago, we had around 20 energy producers here in Ettlingen. Today, we have almost 900. The majority of this customer generation is hooked up to our control center. That creates new risks around IT security. There's a loophole that could be abused. We set out to find potential loopholes and quickly find one at a primary school in the town centre. While IT classes are taking place upstairs, the future of the energy transition is starting in the school's cellar. The new heat and power station that's to supply the town centre with electricity and heating has just been completed. Protected by thick walls and under the supervision of the municipal utilities, these plants are supposed to guarantee the power supply. Sascha Zinker, Matthias Dahlheimer and Stefan Zeisberg have found something after just 10 minutes, despite thick walls. There's a wireless network in the cellar. I see no need for there to be a wireless network down here because maintenance technicians can use a cable. A simple cable instead of a wireless network would provide security, but remote maintenance is more convenient and cheaper. The move towards sustainable energy sources is also creating power stations that can be controlled wirelessly via an app, an internet connection and a wireless router. This router is very easily accessible. 
we're just looking into what other devices we can access via this router and whether we can access them via the control system of the power plant. And indeed, other unknown individuals have already been inside this network. We've found out that people have connected to this network with their phones. In theory, they also have access. A standard router with an unsecured Wi-Fi network to control a small power plant. We simulate an attack on the router and switch it off. The municipal utilities control room can't do anything but watch. It's yellow now, and that means the connection has been interrupted. If it remains interrupted for more than five minutes, it turns red, and then there's nothing you can do anymore. The problem is that we can't have a connection to the heat and power station anymore. We can no longer control it from here. We can't influence the temperatures or output. We can't do anything remotely if a problem occurs. If there is a problem, we don't find out about it anymore. A router as a gateway for attackers. With any luck, such events will be limited to student pranks. If you had the time and you're connected to the Wi-Fi network, you could sit out here, disguised as a student, and try to get access for as long as you like. The big danger is that someone who really wants to break something will attempt it. The individual locked in here with a phone can do that too. In Ettlingen town centre, the security of the supply depends on one small router. Municipal utilities boss Erler has to react and repair. My colleagues who took a look at it are going to develop a security concept to make these heat and power stations secure from attacks. If we had 60 power stations and you switched them all off at once, then we'd have a very serious problem. At its most extreme, it could lead to a blackout. But are we just talking about an individual case, about carelessness? No, this programmer has stumbled across a loophole in the system that shows how dangerous even the most minor faults in a single router could become for the whole of Germany. After moving house, Alexander Graf wanted to make a phone call with his old phone via his new provider's cable modem. Since that didn't work, he took a closer look at the modem and made a frightening discovery. While searching for the problem with his phone, he came across a network connection to the provider's entire cable network. The password he needed to access it came with the modem. One was even unencrypted in his router's memory. Millions can be made on the black market with such an unrecognized security loophole known as Zero Day. Fraudsters can spy on millions of citizens as they do their phone banking or make expensive foreign phone calls via their numbers. A billion devices could be affected, from routers to aircraft. It's used wherever we have safety-critical systems, and certainly also in respect of infrastructure such as nuclear power plants. The question is always, how linked up are the systems that are open to attack? A security loophole becomes particularly problematic when you connect systems that weren't designed to be connected. When you have systems that don't have any security concepts for access rights, for example, but you put them online and then they're open to attack. That's a real security risk. Linking up devices creates additional risks. The vulnerability of individual devices is worrying enough. But it's only when they're linked up that blanket attacks can occur. But when the risk is so high, why are devices even linked up in this way? Why don't we operate every wind turbine and solar panel separately? 
We get the answer to this question at the University of Ulm. Professor Gerd Heilscher's research has shown that the transition to renewable energies can only succeed if all producers are intelligently connected. Experts call these networks smart grids. Smart grids need different meters, smart meters, that we'll all be getting in time. That's the only way to balance out the green energy produced, resulting in a stable electricity grid. If we want to use wind and solar energy, we have the problem that wind doesn't blow all the time, and there's no sun at night. We have to track the ups and downs of production to deal with them. That's what we get from the smart grid. If our electricity comes from solar or wind power, production and consumption have to be matched up every second. There's a fluctuation in how much electricity is produced, so we need smart grids and a test lab. Are there test facilities here in Ulm? Yes, in addition to this roof, we have a test area in Einsingen and another one in Hittestetten. In Einsingen, it's 25% of the energy requirements, and in Hittestetten, no less than 100% is produced locally from solar power. The future of the energy transition seems to have arrived. The synchronous grid of continental Europe, as it's called, will only remain stable in its 50 hertz frequency if we manage to keep the decentralized production of millions of citizens in balance with all household consumption. The Koba family are in the middle of the energy transition. They live in one of the test areas in Ulm. They've made their own home smart, much to their children's delight. They like playing with all the gadgets. Patrick Korba appreciates the convenience but he's professionally secured his network. The command center's located in the basement of their home. We tried to hack it, but to no avail. The passionate tinkerer has used a simple trick. After having a chat with our insulation companies, we decided to have the heating controls offline. They're installed on a computer that has no connection, so it can't be attacked. His project home is simply not connected yet, and that's why it's safe. But that's to change soon if the government gets its way. Soon every house will be connected with a device that will replace traditional meters, a smart meter. Smart meters aren't there just to measure the consumption and production of electricity. In future, they should actively control the performance of solar panels, wind turbines and consumption in the home. The vision is as follows. If there's too much electricity, the smart meters will switch on washing machines, crank up fridges and charge up electric cars. If there's too little electricity, then smart meters should be able to draw on reserves, such as from the batteries in electric cars. Smart meters are already in use in Spain, Italy and Finland. Germany is lagging a few years behind. Although the rollout of smart meters in Germany started officially on the 1st of January 2017, there are no devices yet that meet high German security standards. Nevertheless, the industry is celebrating the market of the future. Having smart meters is an opportunity for Germany. I want to get right to the heart of it. The law to digitize the energy transition has removed the final hurdle. After five years of political discussion, we have cleared the way for the introduction of smart meters. Citizens are coming of age in the field of energy too. They can now make independent decisions. There'll be entirely new business models. We don't know many of them yet, but I always have an image in the back of my mind from the liberalization of telecommunications. When we give young children an old-fashioned telephone with a dial today, what do they do? They try to push the numbers or swipe them. 
That's the kind of change I'm hoping for with these new smart meters. A new world, but is it safe? The massive use of smart meters caused hacker Javier Vazquez Vidal to come up with a plan. He and a colleague were able to hack into millions of smart meters in Spain with just a single device. Fortunately, he's one of the good guys. It was a test. That's why Spain suffered no blackout. We were able to uh, get into the network through the smart meters and control them, which Obviously, it's funny because the new smart meters that we were getting installed have a remote disconnection feature. That basically means that if you don't pay your bill, the electrical company will just shut down your electricity remotely with a click of a button on a remote computer, maybe like 1,000 kilometers away from your house. And we were able to control that and uh, even found a way that would have allowed us uh, to craft custom updates, which could be considered somewhat like a virus, because if you craft a custom update that will shut down at some time or will listen to a backdoor or command or whatever, it will, will turn every smart meter into a flashing tool. So basically one smart meter will update others. Then when those others get updated with the code, they will update others. So it will spread pretty much like a virus does, even though it's not running a real OS, but the way of working is the same. So you could cause a big blackout just uh, by having access to one smart meter. And by having access, I don't mean opening it. I mean, just on the optical port and no one would ever know how it started or how it happened. Javier immediately reported the security loophole to the manufacturers, after which he started working for a company in Ulm. With the serious security problems of the Spanish smart meters in mind, Javier Vasquez Vidal's team took on a German model. They spent several weeks looking into a first-generation device from a German manufacturer, one, however, which hadn't been built for the demands of the transition to renewable energies. First impression of the board was that it was extremely basic. It's very clear that the product itself wasn't developed with security in mind. It's very easy for any attacker who has physical access to the device. The manufacturer can't understand every component used in complete detail. They just look at the bits that are relevant to them. And that's what they build their entire product around. But if the components do other things too that they don't need, then that can be a weakness. While we're doing our research, the manufacturer gets in touch with us. The company tells us they're aware of the weaknesses and are working on a new generation of devices and that they have invested several million euros into making these devices safe. The Conexa 1 was advanced for a first device of this type, but attacking it is no longer a problem. I think a good hacker could do that with a decent mobile phone. This generation of devices compares to the new one like the old Nokia phone compares to modern smartphones. If these old devices were connected, they could be attacked. That's why the Federal Office for Information Security has given manufacturers specific instructions about how to protect themselves against hacking attacks. Here we have the Conexa 3.0. We've taken all the specifications issued by the Office for Information Security into account. They've told us exactly what security technology to incorporate into our devices. By the time we finished making this film, the Federal Office for Information Security hadn't yet certified any of the eight manufacturers' smart meters. And anyway, certification's one thing, liability quite another. 
Politicians dream of manufacturers being liable for everything in the future. As a manufacturer, what do you have to say about politicians demanding product liability? As equipment manufacturers, we find this whole topic really difficult to address. Imagine that we have a hacking attack on these devices in three years' time. How can we say now how that will happen and where the attack will come from? We'll try to address the risks as best we can over time. So, we're always up to date. But I don't think any system is totally secure. Manufacturers and hackers agree there'll never be 100% security in the digital world. The goal has to be to give hackers the biggest run for their money as they can, because for them too, time is money. The Federal Office for Information Security has a simpler interpretation. When you get into a car, which is also highly complex with many individual systems, an engine, brakes and steering wheel, it's relatively clear that the car manufacturer is always liable for all areas, for all subsystems that don't work. But in the cyber world, we say it's so complex, we're all using it, but nobody's liable because it's hard to prove. Unsolved liability issues, security loopholes wherever we turn, and daily attacks from the web. There are even digital blackmailers penetrating areas that are literally a matter of life and death. What happened at the Lucas Hospital, which was a fully digitized hospital and one of the district's intensive care centers, was that we were informed that the entire IT infrastructure had been shut down because of a ransomware attack, so it could no longer provide emergency cover. We wondered what would happen if a patient with a heart attack had to be taken to somewhere 15 minutes further away and died as a result. What happened? February 2016, the Lucas Hospital is an important part of emergency care in the district. It's fully connected in order to save lives. Patient scans are remotely accessible so that better and faster treatment can be given, for example. Then there are the results of the tests done on hundreds of blood samples every day. The network distributes them to the relative departments in real time. The cardiology department relies on modern IT too these days. The digital revolution is also revolutionizing medicine and increasing lifespans. What's important is that everything's faster. We get results right away. I can take scans to the patient, scans I didn't have before, and show him or her the problem. Or I could show the patient other examples of pneumonia. You are highly connected and then there was a problem. What happened? We had an external hacking attack. To protect our data, the systems had to be shut down. With that, the complete system was switched off and our capacity was significantly reduced. Digital blackmail always follows the same principle. It happens when someone opens a manipulated attachment, when surfing a fake website, when clicking on a bad link. By making such a wrong click, malware is activated, which then spreads undetected in the system. Disguised as a harmless code, the Trojan grabs all the data and encrypts it. Nothing can be done anymore. The Trojan has taken over the computer. The victim is given a choice, Either the data is destroyed forever, or a ransom has to be paid quickly. Those who pay have to hope that the attacker will decrypt the data again after a successful transaction. Those who don't pay may well lose it forever. No patient was harmed, but the damage cost the Lucas Hospital millions of euros its entire digital structure had to be rebuilt. Whether it's a highly specialized hospital or a simple hotel, as soon as they hook up to the web, they are vulnerable to attack. Our research has shown that security measures aren't keeping up with the rapid pace of digitization.
I present our research results to the President of the Federal Office for Information Security. We had hacked light bulbs and managed to break into a building that way. We could have taken wind turbines off grid or even entire heat and power plants. So are we really better protected than Ukraine? Of course, we'll close these loopholes over time. Businesses have to face up to their responsibilities, and we have to introduce minimum standards. That's what we're doing together. It's a task for society, and I would prefer critics not to spread panic and instead make constructive contributions, instead of pinpointing weak spots, also put forward possible solutions. Critics just complain, but don't contribute. In cyberspace, we live in a globalized world. Can one government or a single country even guarantee security at all? The state isn't responsible for everything. The state protects its citizens, but it's like in traffic. If I drive drunk and cause a crash, I'm personally responsible. We try to explain to people that when the traffic light in the cyber world is red, you should stop and take the relevant measures. If it's green, you can proceed if you've installed the necessary updates, for example. If you don't stick to those rules, you shouldn't be surprised when you get run over. But given how many security loopholes we have found, is it really that simple? And we personally decide whether we're going to drive a car. Nobody else does. But we don't have that same choice in the context of the green energy. And the risk is much greater, too. Our research has confirmed that just a simple mass-produced component could suffice to trigger a major disaster. To stay with the traffic light metaphor, traffic lights are good, but what happens when hackers switch them all to green? <laughs>